So good afternoon, everyone. I am extremely thrilled, extremely excited to welcome Humphrey Slocum to talks at Google today. Um, Humphrey Slocum, yes, yeah. They even brought us ice cream. How awesome is that? So. <laughs> A lot so, of bigger cheer for the ice cream than us? Come on. So, <laughs> so, so for, those, for those of you that uh, may be tuning in on, on YouTube, Humphrey Slocomb is a bit of a San Francisco tradition. They're an, uh, they're an icon, a humble ice cream store on 24th and Harrison in the Mission. Um, they constantly push the boundaries of, of ice cream as a, as a dessert and as a way of life. Um, and today we have um, joining us the, the two folks behind it. We have Jake Gold, Goldby and, and Sean Vahey. And they created the icon. Um, their fame is spread nationally. They're here actually now to talk about their, their book, appropriately titled The Humphrey Slocomb Ice Cream Book. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and talk a little bit about the book, talk about ice cream making. Um, we'll have time for your questions at the end. We'll have a Q&A mic over there. So please join me in welcoming Jake and Sean to Google. Thank you for having us. So the, the first thing I wanted to start out with was the, the book itself. Um, what was your inspiration, your idea for making it? Um, how did it come about? Well, we were actually approached to do the book initially because it wasn't even on our radar. No, we had a couple of different publishers approach us about doing a book. And at the time, we were only like a year old. And it's like, why? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. we, were, we still felt like such newbies at the game. So. And then it took us an additional year to write it, so we were two years yeah. in by the time it came out. Yeah. Cool. Cool. And and it seems to me like go, going through the book and like reading about your your story as to how you two met and you know formed the business and everything. It's it, it's a story very similar to that of Grant Atchitz and Nick Kukunis over at um, Next and Alinea in Chicago. You know, one one person's doing the the flavors, you know, advancing the craft there, and then one person's handling the the business. So, so um so Jake, I wanted to know how did you decide to specialize in ice cream from your prior pastry training? Um. Well, to be honest, um, I thought I could, we could open up an ice cream shop with less people than it would take to open up like a bakery, per se. Because when we opened, it was just Sean and I. Mm -hmm. I made a, we both, he scooped it, or we both scooped it, and working 20 hours a day, working our asses off. But if we did something else, it would be more of a production, and we didn't, yeah, it was just not possible. Yeah. And, and, by yeah. ourselves sucked. Yeah, it was terrible. I, I mean, we literally worked all day. You made ice cream all night yeah. while I drank. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and we tried to deal with it. And you had that champagne party where you got your your first employee. Or we did. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah, yeah. That, that's Emily. actually an interesting story. We um, when we had a kind of a thank you party for our friends and our family, and we had so much help. And um, during the party, we were like, we're going to hire somebody from this party who's helping us pour champagne. And the deal was whoever kept my glass full the entire party is who we'd hire, <laughs> despite what their background was. And yeah. enter Emily. And she stayed for three years. And she stayed for three years. She can pour a mean glass of champagne. <laughs> That's nice. And, and Sean, so how was the, uh, the transition to managing the, the ice cream front from your uh, prior experience in the, the restaurant business? It was really weird because I came from a background of Hyatt and Four Seasons. And so I kind of thought I knew everything. And I didn't know anything. You know, this nothing prepared me for, for what Humphrey Slocum uh, brought us, and you know, we're still learning a lot. So, you think you know something, but you know nothing. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of our success comes from his fine dining, or both of ours fine dining background, because we tried to create the same experience in our little ice cream shop that you would get at a nicer restaurant. Yeah. The same level of customer service. That's right. I mean, customer service, I would say, is <clears throat> it's kind of the same across the board. No matter if you're like super rich or if you're just like us, <laughs> yeah. poor. And um, everybody wants the same good customer service. So it doesn't matter if you're at Four Seasons or Humphrey Slocum, you're, you still want to be treated well. And that, tr that, that really interpreted well across, across the board. But everything else, forget it. You've got to learn how to run a business and like fast. So. Oh, cool. And then, and then also another um, key component of your success is your, your massive Twitter following and the, the hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Um, and you d describe we're it. In we're the still getting used to that. Um, we, don't, we still don't know how it happened, right? I mean, <laughs> it, we knew we had a great product, and we knew that we wanted people to come to our area of the mission. So we turned to Twitter, and <clears throat> we had no advertising budget. For, yeah, it was like negative $1,000. So. Uh, when we turned Twitter on, we were like, what is this sh It was so boring. It was like, I'm going to go to the mall. 
And like, <laughs> we're like, what? So we made our Twitters really dirty and like really naughty. And we were just like, we just wanted people to pay attention to us so that it would, they'd eventually come to the store. So it got us in a lot of trouble, but it yeah. also got us the attention that we wanted. Yeah, um, I've had described to me that we're like the sassy gay friend of the Twitter sphere. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. I've never heard that, but yeah. Um, and then as we started getting more people, you know, we toned it down a little bit. So I think we found a nice balance. So and if you're not following us, follow us. At Humphrey Silicon. And, and likewise, you, 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 you grew like a, a rabid fan base, but also some, some haters that you mentioned in the book. You described oh, yeah. as your, your frenemy well, that, Twitter thing. Yeah, that was like the harshest reality. It was like, you know, we're, we're, we're generating a lot of attention through the way, the direction we decided to go, which was naughty. <clears throat> so then with all the people that kind of love the, um, the spirit of it, there's also people that are like, all right, if you guys want to be you know, this sassy, I'm going to take you on. And we had some pretty harsh haters. Yeah, we've had a parody as well. And death threats. And death threats. And, and it's just, yeah. there's some crazy people out there. You <laughs> haven't I lived until you got your first death threat, let me tell you. <laughs> it's all that, that fetal kitten, you know, people just <laughs> yeah. can't get behind it. <laughs> exactly. Um, and you even include some of the, the, the tweets and emails in the book, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, that was our publisher's idea, oh. and um, we weren't sure how we were going to do it. Originally, it was going to be kind of like a ticker line across the bottom, but I'm glad we didn't do that because each tweet kind of has its own personality, I think, mm -hmm. and it's, they're fun to read separately, so I think our publisher did a great job. Oh, cool. Kind did, of separating them. Did you have like this archive of like really crazy emails to, to go on, or did you, was it oh, we, we save more because oh, we, we didn't know the book was going to happen that way. Yeah, so, there's we, so many good ones we lost. We had so many good ones, and the ones that were like the scariest, we decided to post like on our freezers, just so that it wouldn't intimidate us. Like we wanted to own we, it. We had know? to embrace it. Yeah. So like the really scary ones, like the death threats, the ones that said people were going to kill us, we, we were just like, all right, let's post them, let's look at them every day, and let's like own it. Yeah. I wish we'd kept them. I wish we had kept the erotic poetry that one guy. Oh yeah, we had, we had people drop off erotic ice cream poetry. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We've gotten all kinds of great emails. And then you and you maintain that style through the book too. One thing that I really enjoyed was the um, the same irreverent style you present in the storefront is also there in the writing. So is that a is that a conscious decision? Did that just sort of yeah, come absolutely. out of your pen as you were typing along? Um, yeah, we, um, I think we wanted to just kind of keep our voice. And um, that was also the biggest struggle because, you know, we understand that our publisher wants to sell books and, you know, we, we do too, but we also, I mean, we had to keep the cursing down a lot. Yeah, I mean, if there's anything that both of us can't stand, and that's just, we hate Q. Yeah. And it's so easy to go Q. An ice cream book. Yeah. yeah. They yeah. snuck that picture of the kid in our book. <laughs> yeah. we, we said that there could be a kid in the book, but the kid's got to be crying and their ice cream has to be on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> but, like, that's yeah. what but we wanted. Yeah. There are much more pictures of trannies being children yeah. in the book, so we fought for that. And dentists, apparently. No dentist in an ice cream book, except okay. for this one. Yeah, I was like, Jake, you can't mention your dentist in an ice cream book. Like, that's, you know, going to oh. drive people away. Nah. Right. So, it, and just um, moving also on to the, um, the ice cream making process, you know, in the book you describe, you know, the importance of creating a base, and then you go through talking about several different bases. So we have, like, the Philly style, which is, you know, without eggs. We have, like, a sorbet. We have, you know, the, the, full, the full bodied cream. Um, do certain bases work better with certain flavors? You know, what was your approach for, um, you know, choosing the, the different ones? That's Jake. I have sweaters um, in my oven, so. <laughs> well, I think... For the Philly style, which is without eggs, I think that's a bit nat more natural fit for cleaner flavors like a fruit flavor, like a strawberry, because there's less fat to mask the tongue and just it um, comes across more cleanly. But you lose. But the ones that have egg yolks are just a more fuller, richer, fatty flavor. And then the sorbets, you know, focus on the the essence of the flavor itself. Yeah, exactly. So. Standing alone. And then, you know, what about like sort of non-dairy bases like soy? You know, we've seen I don't know almond about milk. That. <laughs> all right, we, we won't mention any of that at all. Is it froyo? Uh, no, we're an ice cream shop. Yeah. There's, uh, there's people ask about that, and it's like no, it says ice cream on the door. We will. And, yeah, we will and, never intentionally do a fat-free or sugar-free or. Yeah, it's just we only have yeah. 12 flavors a day. I want to. There's plenty of other places to go. 
And it was, it was interesting, actually, today in, in the cafes at, at Google, we, we rolled out a salute to Humphrey Slocum. We had a, a bit of a, a, bit of a, a throwdown, a smackdown, if you will. So we had um, all frozen yogurt, though. We used to have ice cream, but we have since moved in the froyo direction. But we had some hibiscus beet. We had some um, cur a curry caramel. And then, you know, the secret breakfast, it was, nice. it was pretty cool. Great. So good. But yeah, I think we need. I fully support people doing, doing that sort of thing and having fun. And that's one of the points yeah. you make in the book too. It's like you know you need to change the flavors. You know, throw in like you know more of, of one, less of another. Like mm -hmm. make it your own flavor instead that's of right. just yeah. following the book. I mean, it's pretty cheap and easy to make ice cream in a little ice cream machine at home. And if it doesn't work, you just start over again. Yeah. yeah. So. And put your own personality into it. You know, that's that's how Jake came up with a lot of these, and it's easy for you to do yourself. Cool. Cool. So we do have some questions from from the Twitter base. You know, they submitted using. Google moderator. So the first one I have is from uh, a Dan H. in the United Kingdom. Um, he wants to know, what is your number one, hands down, um, favorite piece of inspiration, that's favorite with the U, um, you've had, which led you to create a flavor, and, and what was it? God, Michael Jackson. Oh. Yeah, that's a good one. Yeah. Our, um, our biggest selling sorbet is um, Jesus Juice. And <laughs> I know. And um, <laughs> It was Michael Jackson's passing that inspired us. There was a, we've done a lot of tribute flavors over we the years. We do a lot of tribute was, flavors. I think that might have been the first one. Yeah. My favorite was Golden Girls, though. Yeah, but, but um, yeah, it's a red wine and coke sorbet yeah. in tribute to Michael Jackson. If you don't know, get the reference, you can look, you can Google it. Exactly. Yeah. We probably can't mention the reference <laughs> yeah. here. But. So what was the Golden Girls one? I think I missed that one. Oh my god, it was strawberry cheesecake. Uh, yeah, when Rue McCallaghan died, we did, when a Rue passed away. we did a strawberry cheesecake. It was so good. Tribute flavor. I it's such a not like a Humphrey Slocum. It's not a Humphrey Slocum flavor. So it's not typical us, but I mean, you guys. I don't know if you guys remember Golden Girls, but um, uh, they that's what they, they always cheese. sat around the kitchen table eating cheesecake. So. Um, I think my favorite inspiration story is Secret Breakfast. It was be way before the shop even opened. I was back in Ohio having a road trip with friends. And was thinking about what kind of flavors I wanted to make with my friends, and my friend Eric just out of his mouth came "secret breakfast," not in a, and that just clicked with me. And then I figured out what it would be. And that's also the first flavor you made me when yeah. we decided to get together and do this. And I remember eating it, and like I was like, "Oh shit! Like this is the beginning of the end. Like this is <laughs> it's the flavor that like got us going." Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And, and along those lines with the, the small batches, we have a question from, from Mark um, uh, in New York. Um, he wants to know why you, why you even produce in such small batches. And then he goes on to notice inconsistencies in the flavor profiles when he gets a same flavor from a different batch. Good. So um, with salt and pepper and like olive oil. So He should get a little inconsistency because yeah. it's handmade. Yeah, everything. Well, the small batch thing is we didn't know we'd be so busy. And I should have bought a larger machine. <laughs> but, <laughs> Uh, but we we work with what we have, and the, you know, what we we work with all are as organic as possible, local as possible things. And if you know, sometimes a batch of strawberries is sweeter or more tart than another batch. Um, sometimes the salt and pepper will steep a little bit longer, or it's a finer grain that we've used. And there's going to be variances, and I'm totally okay with that. I don't think they've ever been so much that you're getting a completely different flavor. I mean, we, we taste the ice cream during the entire process that it's made. And um, you know, we like it to be consistent, but you will get different nuances. And you know, a batch of strawberries that we'll, that we'll have delivered will be you know, just intensely sweet. And another batch will be, you know, have a little bit of a tartness. Or, or you know, everything will be a little bit different because of the, the fresh ingredients that we're using. So. Well, do you, do you get like um, feedback and adjust for more from the customers, or is it more like you prescribing like you know strawberry should be should be tart, vanilla should not be ordinary? Well, um, we'll bring back flavors because our guests ask. I mean, that happens a lot. Sure. But it, or if like a flavor is not super successful, we won't put that back in rotation. And then we also have flavors where the fruits in season for like just a couple weeks. Like our sweet summer corn is only in season for a short amount of time, and we try to get as much of that out there as we can. But yeah, we, we listen to our guest feedback very intensely. 
Cool, and, and, and along those lines, and we have um, Kimberly from Illinois was wondering, um, would the most popular flavor besides Secret Breakfast? I mean, the Secret Breakfast obviously runs Jeez. away on its own. Oh, coffee. Coffee? Uh, that yeah, blue the Blue Bottle Vietnamese coffee, because it goes so well with the Secret Breakfast, mm -hmm. but the, the highest selling sorbet is Jesus Juice, for sure. Yeah. Oh, cool. And, and the, the coffee is on um, every day or almost every day. Yeah, it's one of the three flavors, so it never yeah. changes. We keep um, coffee, secret breakfast, the Tahitian vanilla, and um, That's it. we also have balsamic for the oh. Sunday, but it's not out. Cool. And then, um, then we had a, guy, a person named Fennel in Chicago. Um, were there any flavors you thought would, would be great but just didn't you know, pan out in the, the marketplace? And also, what's the most savory ice cream you've ever made? We tried to make a tribute to Peter, Paul, and Mary called oh, Puff wow. the Magic Dragon. That actually didn't even make it on, yeah. it didn't even make it past the lab phase because we were trying to incorporate hemp oil into it. Yeah, I forgot. I... And we wanted to make it green. Yeah. So I think there was some spinach in there too. There was, it was a horrible. Yeah, forgotten all about that. Yeah, and we, we had to make it pretty quickly because um, uh, it was like the next day. So yeah. that didn't even make it out, but. Yeah, actually, it was pretty bad. I had um, I had spinach flavored ice cream one time in the Google cafes, and it was oh, nice. surprisingly good. I, it oh. sort of worked, but that sounds yeah. gross. <laughs> so, um, is there also like a, this master a master calendar? You know that like there's going to be like some some flavor rotation that you know if you don't see it today, you know within the next three weeks it'll be back or no. Just we'll never. Whim. Yeah, I mean we can't promise that just because you know we can't look that far out. You know we, we don't know if. Again, I'm using strawberries. Um, I mean, with those holiday flavors that we, we know we're going to have. Oh, yeah. That yeah. Sort like of Rosemary's thing. Baby. And yeah, yeah, or um, pumpkin, the five pumpkin, spice. Five Spice Pumpkin, yeah. or um, I Have a Dream Sickle by Martin Luther King Day. Baraki Road's coming back for obvious reasons. Cool. Nice, nice. And so, so the book itself was written towards the perspective of the home chef. You know, you want more people to, to make ice cream on their own, you know, use the, the machines they have. Um, and so you designed it for no matter what machine they make, so whether it's a Cuisinart or a, a, a gerbil ball, as you, as you mentioned. Um, what's, what's one um, simple mistake or, or common um, pattern that people fall into when they make ice cream at home that they can That's avoid in the future? Um, well, it's, for me personally, I think I'm not going to say specifically for ice cream, but people are afraid of salt. Usually, and all of our ice cream has salt, and I think it helps just make the flavors more punchy. And so, and you also talked about the importance of um, of making the bases and making sure you get those right before you move on to um, sort of the graduating towards more flavors. Yeah, and try a, a couple, buy the recipe first, and then when you feel comfortable enough to play around, go for it. Yeah, focus on the fundamentals. Yes. So. Right. Uh, so, any advice on unfolding in ice, uh, unfolding in ingredients, whether that's caramel or or like nuts or whatever? That's that's one issue that I always had when I made my ice cream um, at, at my apartment. I just couldn't get the fold right. Hmm. But, <laughs> what were your issues? Well, I, I mean, it seemed like you know I, I would like put it in the top, and then I I, I, I thought I was like in a cold stone. I wasn't sure if I needed to like <laughs> dump it out on the on the marble slab uh, or like do it inside the. the uh, I mean, machine. it's certainly up to you. I mean, if you want it to be completely uniform and try to mix it up as much as possible. But I like little pockets of, I like clusters. It's fine. But. Oh, cool. And then, and then of course, your, your recipes are, are scalable, too. So if you want to like do half a batch or like sample, it's, yeah, it's doable? I mean, I mean, they all make about a quart. So it'd be kind of difficult to do less than that. But. And that's pretty standard for home makers, right? Yeah. Quart. And so um, looking at the, the wider world, it seems like once, once you guys got started, like other, other groups popped up as well. You mentioned in the book that you had this dream of opening a, um, an ice cream truck. Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, your, the, the, our friends in New York, the big gay ice cream truck, they made it, they made it through. Um, they succeeded where, where we, you haven't got off the ground yet. Um, any, any jealousy there? Or how did the relationship start with them? Actually, not really, because they went from truck to store. And you know, we originally looked at a truck, and it I don't know. SF they have different it. regulations for food trucks in New York than we have. It's pretty so. impossible to do an ice cream truck. Well, they don't make their own ice cream either. Uh, um, so it, we were required to have a place to make the ice cream and then take it on the truck by the department, the dairy department. Mm -hmm. So that that's how we turned into a shop. Oh, cool. 
So. so basically, if you make ice cream, package it, put it on the truck, you can sell it fairly easily. But if it's like us, where you make the ice cream and you want to scoop it on the truck, it's, there's a whole new set of guidelines, which is why you don't see a whole lot of ice cream trucks in SF. I don't know if you've noticed that, but there aren't really. There's like one that I know of. Yeah. No. I'm like, thanks a lot. And, and then if I remember right, you, you all created a pop-up restaurant too. So how did that, how did that turn out? And, or what will you be it revisiting so in the good. future? Oh, um, me, uh, that's it's your pop-up. Yeah, yeah, I'm doing a little. It's a little side project just to have something to do that's not ice cream, just for, for another outlet um, and to have fun. It's every three weeks. It's called the Truck Stop Cafe. All right. It's, a, it's a, also on Twitter. Yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a dirty, divey little gay bar. Oh, cool. And then, and then also the the partnerships extend too through area restaurants. You know, you supply ice cream to you know places like Mission Street Food, you know, Encanto. Um, Flour and water. Um, are there any particular pairings that you're you're most proud of, and how do you approach the collaboration with actual restaurants? Oh, we have so many. Um, we love everyone that we work with. I mean, um, we I know Jake, um, you know, works closely with a lot of the chefs, and you know, a lot of our relationships stem from friendships. You know, just in the restaurant community that that Jake's had or, or I've had, and um, we love working with everyone. It's hard to nail that down. Yeah, I mean, it's, tough. it's different with each restaurant because a lot of chefs want to be involved in every single aspect. And a lot of them just want nothing to do with pastry and just want to let us help them make decisions. And we do both. And it's a dialogue. And it actually is one of my favorite parts of the job. It's just working with the chefs. And, and, and so to, to what extent do you have to work with the, the entire menu or does the, the ice cream stand, stand on its own? Like, um, well, the entire menu, not at all, but um, some chefs will ask ideas about pairings and that, what well, do you think would go with this, and that sort of thing. And, and apparently, you, you mentioned in the book um, olive oil as being the next, uh, the next great topping, right up there with hot fudge, caramel, and, and, and the whole lot. So I'm a little, I'm a little lost there. I, 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 I've never had it is. before. I see olive oil as an ice cream topping a lot. Yeah, um, yeah I think... Ours is incorporated. We use right. Mac McAvoy, which we think is the best olive oil yeah. on I'm, the planet. If it's always one of my flavor suggestions for restaurants because it's a nice alternative to vanilla in that it pairs well with almost everything. Yeah, and you can like you can build it up and pull yeah. in more flavors. And, sure. Oh, cool. And then so also I wanted to look a little bit more towards the future too. And so we do have time for the audience Q and A. So if you have questions, sort of. Um, spinning in your mind, if you will, you can actually line up at the mic, and then we'll we'll get to them as well. Um, you you have a new project that you mentioned in the book called the the parlor. Uh, can you tell us anything about that? Like, how is that uh, coming along? Um, <laughs> it's like everything. Every business in San Francisco it takes a lot longer and a lot more money than you initially think it's going to be, uh, and it's opening up something even after opening a business. It's still extremely difficult. It's going to be a bakery cafe. Some, okay. Someday. Oh, cool. So, like, in the, in, still in the mission? Or, oh, yeah. Uh, um, yeah, in the mission. Florida in 20. Oh, so cool. Close to Petro, Petro Mission. Hmm, nice. And then also, um, it, I was wondering as well, like, Humphrey Silkholm is definitely ingrained in, in San Francisco culture. It's really a part of SF. It's in the Wear magazine. It's sort of the, the Food Network comes by there, too. Um, do you ever see this um, tradition expanding beyond the Bay Area? We had one person, um, Apurvia. Um, who was clamoring for one in San Diego. So are we going to see um, mail order Humphrey Silcombe or? We actually did mail ice cream for a little while, and it was a disaster. Yeah. It's so bad. It's extremely <coughs> expensive to ship ice cream. And, and it's, the timing has to be perfect. Yeah, and and you just, can't mail more than, what is it, five pounds of dry ice, and it takes 10. Yeah, and, the way and we it was just it. embarrassing to tell people how much it costs to for them to buy like five pints of ice cream because I, Need the dry ice. yeah, and it was like I felt like they were thought we were gouging them. But we really, we were not making anything off that. It's going to FedEx. It's <laughs> hundreds of dollars. Yeah, to so. get six pints of ice cream. So, so do you think you think you'll see um, flavors in the in the pint at Whole Foods or at the packaged liquor store or something like We've that? We've been approached. <laughs> yeah, people uh, are asking us. But we're just a tiny little ice cream shop right now. We have to figure out. We would have to have a larger production facility. Well, and that's part of its charm too. Like you know, you come to San Francisco, you, it's yeah. like a destination. Exactly. You, know, you go to the mission, mm -hmm. experience the food that's well, there. It's yeah. Still, such a wonderful thing to hear because we are only three years old, yeah. and it's that's an amazing. Cool. Yeah. So uh, we have some audience Q and A. So yes, you, sir. Please. 
Hi. A quick question about the upcoming foie gras ban. So what will happen to the ice cream sandwich, the foie gras ice cream sandwich? Uh, we, can we have a week of only every day or something? <laughs> <laughs> we should have we're, like a secret flaw password. Yeah, um, we're going to start making it pretty frequently from now on until what is it, July? I think is oh, the yeah. ban. Um, yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have it available a lot more until the very right. end. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. And you made a cheese ice cream too that comes out every once in a while. Yeah, we do a government cheese ice cream not very often. Um, it's very it's expensive, expensive to make. Because yeah. Yeah. we, we use, really don't use government cheese. We use like a, an expensive French cheese called Mimbalat. It's, it's, yeah. Yeah, no, no Velveeta equivalent. Yeah. No, but it looks like Velveeta. Yeah, it looks like Velveeta. The cool. color looks like Velveeta. Hi. Have you guys ever thought about making your own cones? Oh, yeah. <sighs> yeah, we, um, we did a lot of cone research. That's a great question because it's a source of frustration for both Jake and I because. Um, we love ice cream cones too, and yeah. and they smell really good when you go to a place. Oh my god, how great yeah, like is that smell? EC, um, EC and Tara's in Berkeley, yeah. they have yeah. amazing ice cream. Oh my god, cones. EC's cones are so good, yeah, right? They're really good. Yeah. Yeah, but um, some, is this something you guys are exploring? We yeah, we fully researched it. I mean, I think this is one of the things that we did our due diligence on in, in many ways because we do love cones, and um, we went through how many different kinds? I don't know, but like a million. We're so small. Yeah. The, the shop is tiny, and we can barely keep up with making the ice cream. And we do a 1,000 people a day on the weekends. So I just can't see how we could be able to and do it. And we go through almost just as many cones. And you know, it keeps, it keeps the price down, which is great. And you can always get a cone with your scoop. Like I love getting a scoop of ice cream with a cone on top. And I call it with a hat. And um, you know, that way, we're able to give that as an amenity away, whereas if we made them, you know, it would be a little more costly. I think you could probably charge additional for cones. I know EC no, no, does that, and so that would help maybe balance yeah, we the were, economics of it. We were going to go down that road. I mean, we, the, the chefs are already standing shoulder to shoulder in the kitchen. Yeah. I feel so bad. <laughs> All right, awesome. Them. Thanks. Thank you. Well, I'm a dish person myself, so I, I've never had to cross the, the, cone, the cone question. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a dishes person as well. You have to eat it too fast on the cone. Yeah, exactly. I'm a dish and cone. Like, why not both worlds, right? <laughs> Get it all. Hi. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, Thanks for having us. Yeah, in your book, um, you mention, you know, if you're using, if you're going to go with a coffee flavor, we recommend Blue Bottle. Or if you're right. using, you know, this kind of milk, we recommend this brand. Um, that's very helpful. Thank you. Um, but for someone that's trying to experiment on their own, how do you recommend, like, how many times do you guys typically try a certain brand of chocolate before you move on to the next one? Or can you talk a little bit more about that experimentation? That's a good question for Jake. Experimentation. Um, yeah, interesting. I mean, I've been cooking for a long time, so I have, like, my favorites. And we use good tart chocolate at the shop because it's fairly local and it's delicious. And, it's a little bit more, we start out using Valrhona, which is so expensive. Yeah, it's a little bit more cost effective. Um, I, we use products from our friends. Yeah, I would say just like for me, because I don't cook at all, like at all. And <laughs> I would just start off with what your favorite things are. You know, if you have an awesome coffee that you think rocks your world, like use that for the coffee. We love Blue Bottle because we drink it 20 times a day, and we love them as a company, and I think we think they do a great job. But if you have a coffee that you're in love with, use that. Like, why not? Make it your own. All right. Yeah. I'll bring you some hula pie coffee from Hawaii. It's Done. Cool. That okay. would be great. So, thank you. Yeah, and, and, and you also get you know, these ideas from your fans as well, like the, um, the, the salted licorice girl, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, <laughs> I feel so bad. If you're watching the video, Salted come licorice back. girl, I'm so sorry. <laughs> we, um, I love black licorice, and uh, we make a salted black licorice ice cream, which is just mind-blowingly good. And we, this is when we first started, it was just Jake and I, and was I just in a bad mood? Well, we were. I was so we over cranky. it. Like, we were, like, we may have even, like, slept in the store that night, like, making ice cream all night, and then we opened it up, it was just like, please, someone stab me in the face. Like, I'm, this is, like, I'm just done. And this girl who I'd made this connection of salted licorice ice cream with came in after coming back um, from, like, where did she go? She was, like, in Sweden. She brought back these chocolates, and I was, and I didn't recognize her right away. And I was, like, can I help you? And she was just, like, you know, her eyes got really big, and she just threw the licorice at me. And I was, like, what the hell just happened? And then it, it automatically clicked. So, 
Licorice Girl, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And, yeah. And that's, <laughs> I know. I know. It's, it's, it's difficult because we see a thousand people a day and they only see the two of us. Yeah. And it so takes us a like, minute to register. That's, I think, one of our biggest frustrations because we meet so many people and we're so happy to, that you know, people are coming in and that, are, that yeah. they want to say hi to us. Mm -hmm. But like, it takes a second. We need like face recognition software. Yeah. Do you guys work on I know. that? It's, for like, us? <laughs> it's like a little private joke, and it's like, um, we'll be nice to meet you, and they'll be like, nice to see you again. Yeah. And we're like, Wah. ouch. Yeah. It's, it's tough, but yeah. salted licorice girl, I'm looking for you. Yeah. And, and you had some other um, crazy guests come through as well. I remember um, Fran Adria stopped by one, one day. Oh, so, yeah, what was, was that like? That was huge. So yeah. humbling. Um, one of everything. I mean, he means he's a culinary rock star, and yeah, he did have one of everything, and he stayed for like an hour and hung out and had his picture taken with everyone in the shop. And, and he's the quote on the back of your books. Yeah, and it's just like a, he travels with an entourage and his chain smoking interpreter, and and that's what we want. We want an entourage <laughs> and a chain smoking interpreter. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was it was surreal. Yeah, sure. And, and so, and what do you think too, like, you know, with, with Fran and the, the molecular gastronomy, we have, you know, different ways of making ice cream too. So there's a place in, in SF that does the liquid nitrogen based ice cream. Like, how does, how does that sort of fit in your world view with, um, you know, you got exotic flavors, traditional methods, they got, you know, more ordinary flavors, exotic methods. We love it. We love Robin. She's great. And um, what a great idea, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. Jake and I have always said, in, especially in San Francisco, there is room for everybody. Room and for everyone. If you set up 20 more ice cream places, like there's room. So go. I think everyone should get as creative as possible and yeah. and go crazy because it's ice cream. Like who doesn't want ice cream? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Cool. Yeah. So um, I I wanted to, to close by by saying one one part of, of Google Culture that I liked, which I think really blends in with your thoughts in the book. So we have a program called Culinary Internships. So for those in the audience that haven't done it yet, you got to do it. You go into the cafe for a morning. You can spin out some ice cream or froyo. And um, it was really one of the, um, the pivotal experiences of my time at Google was making ice cream in the cafes. And, nice. And so. Um, yeah, and everybody, anybody can do that? Yeah, pretty much. That's great. Like you just sign up and you can do different things too. So um, we had one of our chefs was closing down a cafe and so we had whole animal week. And so it culminated with, with us as interns making the bacon implosion, which was like everything a burrito is except all the parts were made from bacon and nice. then baked in the oven. And so that was like <laughs> the craziest that. thing I made. But, but we do normal things. We did some Calvados caramel ice cream, which was like an alcoholic like, you know, cam candy apple. And Excellent. It's good stuff. That's so, a great idea. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So we had, Must be a fun place to work. <laughs> well, you're welcome to stop by any time. You know, we had Pumphrey still come today, but we need to have an application? continue that. <laughs> Google.com slash jobs. Way to go. Um, cool. Well, well, if that's the case, I... <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, to thank you both for stopping by. And the book, as I said, it's available in stores right now. It's the Humphrey Slocum ice cream book. Amazing read. Use it to revolutionize your ice cream at home. Um, thank you for stopping by for, for all of Google. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.